GLC presents a Studio B production brought to you by the donations of our faithful partners. Hello. How long have you been a Christian? How long have you been a true believer? How long have you known the truth about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, forgiveness, walking by the Spirit? Has anyone ever taken the time to sit down with you and say, there are certain basic things you need to believe and know and walk in in order to really walk with God? So many times we go to church and hear sermon after sermon after sermon and we think, boy, that was a good sermon. I'm going to do that. And then the next week, Oh, that was a good sermon. I'm going to do that. And the next week, oh, that was a good one. I'm going to do that. Have you ever thought about getting sermon overload? Sometimes you can. One time, a man came to our church and he said, did you hear a good sermon last week or the week before? How many of you did? And people raised their hand and he said, how hard was it to put it into practice? Are you still thinking about it? Or did you drop it and go on to the next thing? As a Christian, there's five basic needs. If you're a new believer, or maybe if you're not even a believer yet, and somehow, some way, you were just channel surfing, and you stopped on this station, well, I want you to understand there's five basic needs that you have as a believer, as a human on the planet, and I want to go over those today with you. The first question that you would have is, why do I need God and Jesus in my life? So your basic, your most basic need is a need for God. Everybody has it. St. Augustine was this man who lived a long time ago. He was really wild. He, he was from a wealthy family. His mother, his father died. His mother couldn't do anything with him. He was wild. And then he started living with a lady a lot older than he was. And his mother was just so frustrated and discouraged. And, and she was praying, God, get a hold of my son. And he just kept living that wild life. Finally, she went to a bishop that was a friend of hers and said, please pray for my son. Please, anything you can do to help him. And at some point, Augustine became a believer. And he wrote a lot of books, a lot of writings. But one of the main things he said that was later said by other people, there's a God hole inside of every person. And no matter what you try to fill up that hole with, doesn't matter, it'll never be filled up until it's filled up with God because it was created by God as His way to access you, to enter your life. And nothing you put in there is going to be anything that satisfies you. It's always interesting to me to hear about famous people who get saved and they've done something great, like maybe they won the Super Bowl or maybe they were great as a singer. Who knows? But it's interesting to me to hear them say, I got the award, I won the prize, and I was empty. And I, I said, is this it? Is this all there is? See, they're trying to fill that God hole with something that wasn't God. So why do you need God and Jesus? Because you were made for God and Jesus. You were made to love them. You were made to believe in them. You were made to serve them. You were made to have a life that lives forever. Are you aware that this isn't all there is? Are you a person that says, well, you die, you die. There's nothing after that. Well, how do you know that? How can you... What makes you think you know that answer? There's a God of the universe, and he says that isn't the answer. I'm God. I make the rules. And I say there's eternal life. And you can't get to me except the way I picked 
for you to get to me. You see, there's a lot of religions in the world. All of these religions are trying to get to God. If you're good enough, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, if you believe in a whole bunch of gods, if you believe anybody can get to God, and they're just trying to get to God, and there's a great gulf between them and God, they can't ever please Him. They say, oh, you can't ever please Him. I don't know if I've done enough. Can I do more? Trying to reach God. And God said, you can't do it. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to reach out to you and create a way. And you will have eternal life if you will believe in my way. Well, what was that way? Jesus, he said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. There isn't any other way to get to the Father but by me. So make sure you understand your greatest need is salvation from your sins. Your greatest need is understanding it's, it can't be done by you. It has to be done by somebody pure and spotless who's never sinned, and that's Jesus Christ. There is no other way of salvation. The Bible says that. No other way. Absolute truth, the creator of the universe, and you have to get them into your life, and you do it by becoming like a little child. Now, I realize this is really simple, but I'm doing a very basic series today. I could go into a great deal of depth. I just want to be sure, hey, can you do this? Have you done this? You may say, well, that's so simple. Okay, but have you done it? Now, what else would you need in your five basic needs as a Christian? The Holy Spirit. You say, why do I need the Holy Spirit? Who is he anyway? Can you see him? Can you talk to him? Is he an it? No, he's not an it. Because the Bible says he, Jesus called him he. He said, when he comes, he will lead you into all truth, all knowledge. He'll guide you. He'll correct you. He'll encourage you. He can have his feelings hurt. Well, where did he come from? He's always been. God has always been. Jesus has always been. The Holy Spirit has always been. There's never been a time they haven't been here. One of the things that really irritates me is today there seems to be a move to call God she. Oh, I just every time does it bother you when people do that? Does it does it feel like fingernails scrape you on a blackboard? Oh, I just can't stand it. Because the only thing in the Bible that refers to God as a she is in Isaiah when he says, like the heart of a mother. Can a mother ever forget her child? No. Well, I can never forget you. And yet God is talked about in terms of a masculine image. Now, if we could see God, would he look like man? No, but somehow we're made in his image. Somehow we are. How? We're made in his image in terms of uh, personality, desires, the way we see life, the way we feel toward people, all of that. We're made in his image. But the Holy Spirit is the electricity, the action of God. See, there's no word like Trinity in the Bible. There's not a word Trinity in the Bible. Where did that come from? People just began to see how, the, how God set things up and they began to call it the Trinity. Well, how are God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit different and why do you need the Holy Spirit? God is the creator, the source. But at the same time, Jesus was there in the creation. The Bible says nothing was made that wasn't made by him. And who's the Holy Spirit? He is the personhood of God that can be everywhere all over the world working in each one of us. Well, that still doesn't make it clear to me, Betty. Give me another example. Okay. God is the source of electricity. Jesus brings the electricity to you, and the Holy Spirit is the power that goes through it. Does that help you? So as a Christian, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. When do you get the Holy Spirit? When you become a believer. 
But is there more than that? Absolutely. There's so much more. The Bible says in Ephesians, you were sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit when you became a believer. But Jesus says in Acts and right before he died, there's someone coming and they're going. This person is going to do something. I need to go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come and wait until he has come. And when he comes, his power will be on you. How do you know that really happened? What did those disciples look like before Jesus died? Well, they did a pretty good job until it got scary and then they ran. We probably would too. I mean, it was scary. They could die. After the Holy Spirit came and empowered them, these same men died horrible deaths and counted it an honor to die for the name of Jesus Christ. What happened? What changed them? It was as different as day and night. What changed them? What made them go all over the world? What makes Christianity go all over the world today? Those of you that go to a dull, boring church, that's not real Christianity. Who would die for that? The real Christianity, you would give up your life before you would give it up. That's the power of the Holy Spirit pouring through you. I know someone who was really, really a good Christian, lived by the law, knew, knew the word, knew the rules, and yet he was doing it in his own strength. And someone came and said, you don't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. It's impossible. It's impossible to live the true Christian life for a person. It's impossible. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do it. It changed that person's life just like it changes everybody's life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and counsel. Do you need good counsel? Do you need good wisdom? Do you need understanding? Jesus is the one who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said that. Someone is coming who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Is it a second experience? Yes, it is. According to the Bible, it is. Read the book of Acts. Something happened after they were believers. They were already believers, and yet something happened. This infilling of the Holy Spirit, and their lives changed. They went out everywhere telling people about God. You will be able to do powerful things. Look at Luke 24, 49. Zechariah 4, 6. You know what, Zechariah? That's the Old Testament telling you what was coming. Was the Holy Spirit doing great things in the Old Testament? Yes, he sure was. Through people too. But not like in the New Testament when he was poured out. But in Zechariah 4, 6 it says, Not by might not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Life is so much easier. It's so much easier to work for God. I'm doing these shows. I get so excited because I don't know what I'm going to say. I have an outline. I know what I generally want to say. But every single time I pray, many times I pray in tongues right before the show starts, and I'm praying, Holy Spirit, tell me, just be in charge, be in control. You know who's watching today. Let me say what they need to hear. And I'll be talking, and all of a sudden, an illustration pops into my head. Or a Bible verse pops into my head. That one just popped into my head. That was a Bible verse for somebody that's watching this show today, and you're trying to do it in your own strength, and you can't understand why it isn't happening. Because you prayed about it. Why isn't it happening? Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So get along with the Lord and say, Lord, what does your spirit say? What does your spirit want? God will anoint you for powerful works. It's amazing. And God will teach you how to use the word of God as a sword, the sword of the spirit. He baptizes you. He gives you power. He gives you an ability to cast out demons, heal the sick, do miracles. Do you do them in your own strength? No. Mm -mm. You do them 
by His power. You can get words of knowledge. Well, what is that? Does that mean, oh, you studied the Bible a lot and you got a lot of knowledge about God? No, that's a human effort. A word of knowledge is when you know something about somebody you couldn't possibly know, but God told you. Is it ESP? Mm -mm. It's HSP, Holy Spirit Power. Now, what else do you need as a believer? What do you, what do you need when you go to God and you say, God, what do I need to do to lead this godly life? Number three, you need to read the Bible. So many Christians have ten Bibles in their home and never open them. This is bread. I've, do you ever kiss your Bible? I kiss my Bible. I go, Lord, I love your word. I can't live without your word. I love it. I kiss it. I love it, God. Thank you. Thank you. And when you look at this book, the God of the universe wrote a little bitty book to tell you how to live, how to live for him, how to let him live through you. So why do you need the Bible? It's the Word of God. It's His words. You want God to talk to you? Read this. He'll talk to you through it. If Jesus needed to read the Word, you need to read the Word. Jesus read the Psalms. How do I know that? Because in the Bible, He would even quote the Psalms 119.9. He, he knew the Word. It's like a seed in your life. In uh, Mark 4, 3 to 20, the sower sows the word. It's a seed that grows and has great, uh, a great crop, just a great crop, the word of God. If you say, well, boy, the Bible's kind of boring to me, Betty. I don't like it. Then I would say, God, this is boring. I must be missing something. Help me. If, the, if it's you talking and it's boring, what am I missing? And he'll tell you what you're missing. Maybe you don't have a really good translation. Maybe you have a, a translation that's hard to understand. Get a modern one. That's what I read. I read the New Living Bible. I read the Message. But I also read NIV. And I even go back to King James a lot because I like it. But when I want to really hear God talk to me, I get in that New Living translation. It needs to be the final authority for your life and for all your decisions. You won't make a mistake. If you read the Bible and live your life by it, you won't. You will be a wise man. Our country, America, was founded by men who said the Bible is the Word of God and we need to live and base our country on it. You don't hear that very much today, do you? It's also truthful. There's not any errors in the Bible. And people can say, really? Well, how about this and how about this? Well, if you check it out enough, you'll see there's not errors. It's just people seeing it from a different angle. It's kind of like a car wreck. Two people see a car wreck. One's over on this block, one's down the street, and they say, what would you see? What happened? And they have a little bit different perspective, but they don't contradict each other. They saw the same thing. Also, the Bible has been tried and tested and proven for centuries. There's millions of people who have lived their life by the Bible, and you can too. It's not going to lead you wrong. It puts power in your life, for one thing. It makes you sharp, like you're a sword. You can teach it to your children. You can go to God, and you can say, Lord, you spoke, and were, the world was created by the words of your mouth. So this Bible is living and powerful, and it can change my life, and it can change my family's life, and it, I can be used by you, God, to change other people's lives. So you have to learn how to read the Bible. Many people start at the first and read it all the way through. Some pick one particular book of the Bible and read it for a while. I'm doing that right now. I'm reading 2 Corinthians. Now, why did I start reading 2 Corinthians? I don't know. It just occurred to me one day, I think I'll read 2 Corinthians. Oh, I'm having the best time reading it. But right in the middle of it, I opened up my Bible one day to Jonah. And I thought, I haven't read Jonah in a long time. Read it, saw a whole new thing. Billy Graham says, I've read the Bible all my life. But when I open it up, it's like I see things I never saw before. You will never, ever run out.
of reading the Bible and seeing things in there that are brand new. You can do character studies. Pick some guy in the Bible. Pick some lady in the Bible. And, and say, God, teach me about these people, really. Tell me what they're really like. You can say, Holy Spirit, you are now in charge of my life, and you fill me up. Where do you want me to read? And read that way. But every time you read, sit down and say, before you start, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Speak to me, God. I want to hear your voice. Underline parts that speak to you. Underline th questions. If you have a question, write down. Little question mark. If you see God answer a prayer, put a date by it. You should see my Bible. It's so marked up. Every Bible I've got is marked up. Keep a journal of what God says, of specific answers to prayer. Memorize the verses that are the answer to your problem. There will always be a Bible verse, and you can ask God, would you give me a Bible verse to hang on to that I can trust you, that I can know that this is God speaking to me? Now, I listen to this one God gave me in 2 Corinthians, out of the Message Bible. I was getting ready to come to GLC and do these lessons, and I found this verse. We stand in Christ's presence when we speak. God looks us in the face. We get what we say straight from God and say it as honestly as we can. Oh, that keeps me on target. Oh, that keeps me right where I need to be. And so the last one is, why do I need to pray? Next to the last one, excuse me, why do I need to pray? Because you've got answers you need. Learn to keep a prayer journal. Learn to pray specific prayers. Well, learn to pray in agreement with somebody else. Let's say you've got a really big problem. Well, go to someone and say, would you pray with me? Would you agree to this? And that's based on Matthew 18, 19. Jesus said, if two of you will agree about something and pray, I'll do it. You have to get the mind of the Lord. You can't just take out on your own. Learn to pray persistently. Did God answer your prayer? Mm-mm. Well, how long do you pray about it? A week. I prayed a week. He didn't answer it. You need to pray persistently. Jesus told a story about a lady that nearly drove a judge crazy till he gave her what she wanted. And Jesus said, you need to pray like that. Does that mean God doesn't want to answer your prayer? Why is he taking so long? Maybe there's some things you don't know about that need to take place and that he's working. You just don't know it. Learn to pray about big and little things. Well, what's the guideline? Well, if you need a parking place, pray for a parking place. If you need money to go to the grocery store and you've only got $10, Pray, God, I've got $10. Stretch it. You'd, if it's big, God, get my family in order. God, God, touch my spouse. That's a big one. If it's important to you, it's important to God. And you're going to get to know God, the source of life, if you do it. You've got to learn how to go to God for everything first. Go to Him. Let him guide you. Let him talk to you. Also, it's to give you fellowship with Jesus. When you're praying, just say, Jesus, I want to get to know you better. Recently, I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know how well I know you. I mean, you help me all the time. I can tell you're working in my life. I can tell you're talking to me. I can tell you're using me. I want to know you better than ever. I don't even know what that means, but I want to know you better than ever. Does God always answer prayer? Yes. Yes. Sometimes it's no. But you know, God's no is always for a better yes. There's a song, I thank God for unanswered prayer. Some of those prayers you prayed, if you had gotten the answer you thought you needed from God, it wouldn't have been the answer you needed, and now you know it. What is the last one? The last need, basic need. Why do I need to forgive? It's hard to forgive sometimes. Some of you have been violated Beyond belief, violated, ruined your life, took you off in a path you didn't even want to go in, hurt you, tried to destroy you. Some of you have had your ministry almost destroyed by people who were destructive, and you have to forgive. You say, well, I can't forgive. I'll never forgive them for what they did to me. They did it deliberately. But the main message of the Bible is, if you want God to forgive you, you have to forgive others. Now, if you'll keep that in mind, do you want God to forgive you? You do, don't you? 
Well, you have to forgive them. Well, I'll just tell you right now, it's hard to forgive some people. I was sexually molested by three different men when I was a little girl. Just a little girl playing, having fun. Now, that's pretty bad. One of those was a pedophile. I know that for sure. That means long after he molested me, he was still molesting sweet little kids, just getting them along, and doing awful things. And God said, Betty, you have to forgive him. I said, God, I hate him. I hope he goes to hell. I hope it's, I just, he's destroyed lives, hundreds of lives. God, it's not right. And God said, Betty, is hell bad? Yes, it's awful, God. It's awful. It's real and it's awful. He said, Betty, I don't want anybody to perish. I'm not willing that anybody perish. And you want to be like me, don't you, Betty? Yes, Lord, I do. Then forgive. But God, how do you do it? It's so hard. Just say, God, help me to forgive. Help me to forgive. But Lord, I try, and it's still hard. Then pray over and over and over. Every time you need to, Betty, God, help me to forgive this man. And slowly but surely, I've been able to do that. And I, I ask God to bless that man. Oh, that's hard. But you can do it. You need to forgive because you want to be forgiven by God. Just give it up and say, Lord, I'm tired. I forgive. I forgive them, Lord. Give me freedom. Take the hurt away. Hello, I'm Betty Swan with Betty Swan Ministries, and I have a project called Pennies from Heaven. I want you to help me do it. It's so exciting. People all over America are helping me. What I want you to do is pick up pennies anywhere you find them, on the ground, on the sidewalk, in a car, in a box you have saved, and send them to Wells Fargo Bank to the account of Pennies from Heaven, Amarillo, Texas. And it has to say Amarillo, Texas on the account. If you will do that, together we can feed a lot of people because I can feed people for about six cents in some countries, 10 cents in other countries. It's so wonderful to use something feeding the world with what America throws away, and we can do it together. So far, over $12,000 has come in. Come and help us do it, and thank you for helping me already. This program was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you enjoy this program, we need your support to keep this program on GLC. Please make your checks out to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Please be sure to designate where your contribution is intended. It is very important to let GLC know which programs you enjoy and support.